Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Lorenzato. This is a video about medications used for hypertension. It is just an overview, almost a listing of the medications that then we look at specifically depending upon which medications I've prescribed to you. There are general classes of medications used in high blood pressure management and our choice of which medication generally depends on comorbidity or the other diseases you have or what I perceive as the risk you have for other diseases. Of the classes ACEs and ARBs, they're sort of hooked together because they're both angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. Both of these medications are don't lower blood pressure tremendously, but they are very protective against the fine vascular beds of the kidneys and the retinas of the eye and can be beneficial for the heart muscle as well. They're used in congestive heart failure, they're used in diabetes, and they're used generally in hypertension. Calcium channel blockers are very beneficial. Sometimes we'll choose one that has a better stabilizing effect on rhythm disturbances in the heart, other times one that is more effective at the vascular beds. Beta blockers can also stabilize the heart from certain rhythm problems, particularly after heart attacks. They do have some limitations in terms of their effect on the triglycerides, the fats in your bloodstream, and the risks you have from the types of fats and the structure of your lipoproteins. Diuretics are famous for causing urination. That's one of the ways they work and probably loss of sodium in this way. Um, and there are a number of classes of those. Aldosterone antagonists, particularly spironolactone, is exceptional, except it has limitations that it lowers testosterone level. In women, this is not generally a problem, sometimes beneficial, and men, it can be a problem. The anxiolytics are not one class of drugs, but the function of drugs that lower anxiety. There are several classes that fit into that. Um, we'll explore the benzodiazepines, the Valium-like medications, because they can be particularly good at lowering blood pressure in people that have an anxiety-driven elevated blood pressure. And of course, there are other agents. There is genetic variability in which of these drugs work well. As we move into the area of genomics, that'll probably be understood better just from tests. Now, so it's usually trial and error to some degree. So now that we've listed those, let's look at categorization by heart disease. There can be occult heart disease or a hidden problem of the heart where the chambers are enlarged or vascular problems. There can be problems with pain to the heart and uh, experience due to narrowing of the coronary arteries. There can be history of a previous myocardial infarction with increased rib and rhythm disturbances of early established or late congestive heart failure, of atrial fibrillation and other disturbances, vas uh, rhythm disturbance of the heart, and of structural problems including mitral valve prolapse, which is relatively common, and clotting problems. All these necessitate some judgment about which antihypertensive agent to use. In kidney disease, um, hypertensive management is extremely critical because it will accelerate damage to the kidneys if your blood pressure is not controlled. Also, narrowing of the renal arteries, the arteries going out to the kidneys, will cause elevated high blood pressure, and therefore it is not essential high blood pressure in that case, it's renal vascular. Sometimes the medications we use will help us diagnose that. Kidney damage from infection is always to be worried about, therefore somebody with elevated high blood pressure, particularly in the event that you have back pain near the kidneys or a bladder infection or frequent urination progressing to the perception of a bladder infection, we need to treat early and aggressively if we suspect that your kidneys are becoming infected. A person can have autoimmune kidney disease, and this is looked into occasionally, as well as the issues of, in, of buildup of toxins in your bloodstream, of the acid-base balance in your urine, and how this may affect your risk of kidney stones and other problems that can relate to compromise of your kidneys from high blood pressure included. And lastly, bone strength is something to be concerned in the event that we perceive that you're having osteoporosis. It may, we may influence which medications to take for that by uh, your blood pressure medicines as well. Therefore, um, when to use ACE and ARBs? And whenever possible, the exception is not when there's pregnancy, not when there's bilateral renal artery stenosis. That being said, I do have one patient who has been stented for bilateral renal artery stenosis. He is on an ARB. This is, he also takes his blood pressure regularly. So should he start to be elevated, we know that he's having occlusion of his, of his renal arteries. There are a number of ACE inhibitors that are generic now, making them quite affordable. 
The arblosartan is generic and it has particular benefit in that it can alleviate the symptoms of gout and some of the problems of high uric acid levels that may be happening even without symptoms. It may have some benefits to memory and to decreasing progression of dementias. And in certain breast cancers with known genetic profiling, it may be used because it has particular advantage. The major limitation of ARBs and ACEs, and there are other ones, is that it can cause extreme swelling to the lips and tongue, which is termed different terms, but angioedema or vessel swelling is the most often thought. This is usually triggered from an allergic component or uh, something that triggers the immune system as well as having taking the ACE or ARBs. Therefore, a person can be on an ACE or an ARB for some years and then all of a sudden experience the swelling to the lips and tongue, which can be extraordinarily severe and should, take, should cause a person to go to the emergency room. The diuretics include thiazide diuretics, HCTZ, the famous one, loop diuretics, uh, adapamid, which is a uh, sulfonamide. So if a person has sulfur allergies or sulfonamide allergies, needs to be very leery of this one and some of the other ones. Daily weight should be taken for diuretic use. If a person gains weight rapidly or loses it, it's usually fluid accumulation or loss. Fluid accumulations frequently after a salt load or if the kidneys or heart are failing. And so if there's an, an onset without any increase of sodium, we have to consider that there's been a silent heart attack, for instance. So checking weight's a smart thing. Electrolyte imbalance is always a concern with diuretics. Therefore, we do check a basic metabolic panel or a comprehensive metabolic panel, which include the BU and creatinine, which, are, which monitor how effective the kidneys are per performing removal of those toxins. And other factors, including your sugar, will help understand if a person is diabetic and their blood sugar is over 250, they're going to urinate without any of the use of a diuretic, and they'll also get electrolyte imbalance. Making electrolyte imbalance a greater concern are issues of diarrhea, where there'll be a lot of potassium loss initially, and this could be very damaging depending upon which diuretic a person's on. Uh, dehydration for other causes is also a concern, obviously. Other medications that are being taken we need to follow and the fact that these medications are taken as we ask you to take them is very important. Sometimes I'll ask a person to titrate the medicine themselves. In other words, when they get over a certain weight gain, I suggest that they'll take a diuretic and assuming they come back, they'll do it for several days and get off, avoid sodium and they should not progress up to that additional weight. If they do, if they need to see me and we need to adjust drug levels or do some diagnosis, diagnostics. Calcium channel blockers can be used for angina, for atrial fibrillation, for the treatment of essential hypertension in patients without angina or atrial fibrillation, or uh, they're used sometimes in recurrent headaches. When we do use them, I'll frequently check a EKG to make sure that there's not any problems with uh, electrical conduction systems such as prolonged QT intervals that may cause us not to want to use calcium channel blockers. And, um, it's also, we should know that the dihydropyridine types, um, which are the more common types used in essential hypertension without specific underlying known causes, we have to be cautioned about excessive protein in the urine. Beta blockers are excellent drugs, but they most of them will cause elevation of lipid profiles that will will lower somebody's blood pressure, but they will not live any longer. There's a trade-off, so we have to be cautious when we use these. They are particularly benefit, beneficial in somebody that I'm suspicious of having being risk for rhythm disturbances, particularly after a heart attack. If I suspect that someone's had a silent heart attack, I might put them on a beta blockers. They're also very good for performance anxiety, such as public speaking, or people that have post-traumatic stress syndrome, where they they're, they have physiological reaction to a situation, in which case the beta blockers can blunt the physiological reaction and let them not get anxious and keep their blood pressure down at the same time. As I mentioned, there are problems with the lipid profiles, not the cholesterol pattern, but the lipid profiles is a better way to talk about it, the LDL structure and the HDL structure and the triglyceride. Carvedilol is a very good medicine um, and it's a 
used a beta blocker used with ACE inhibitors, but it is non-selective as a beta blocker, meaning there's beta 1 and beta 2 receptors, and since it crosses over both, it can worsen asthma, causing constriction of the bronchial tubes as well. So in patients with asthma and COPD, we tend to not use it. It's used quite a bit in congestive heart failure. It's very good for that. Aldosterone uh, antagonist is predominantly spironolactone, and as I mentioned before, it has an androgen um, in inhibition effect, its greatest limitation. It is potassium sparing, so people can get very high potassium levels and should avoid potassium supplementation. Mostly used in congestive heart failure and liver failure, and more often in women that we want to lower their, lower their testosterone level and control their blood pressure or just control their blood pressure. Once again, the spironolactone is not used in pregnancy. The anxiolytics can be extraordinarily beneficial in a small group of patients who have high blood pressure that is related to their level of anxiety. The benzodiazepines, valium-like medicines, tend to be the best at this in general, or at least we use these to show that they're, it's effective to use an anxiolytic, and then we may switch you to another class. Of the benzodiazepines, there are longer-acting ones, the clonazepam, there's middle-acting and short-acting. The short-acting ones are lorazepam and alprazolam, which I write mostly lorazepam these days. The cannabinoids are known to break anxiety, and they probably have some play in managing anxiety, contributing to high blood pressure. As I mentioned, beta blockers are beneficial at lowering the physiological response. Ultimately, they quell anxiety some too. Hydroxylene is an antihistamine with anxiolytic benefit. If somebody has insomnia, it's a particularly good one for somebody with hypertension and insomnia where the hypertension may be related to insomnia. And uh, speaking of which, we have to be concerned of potential for sleep apnea. So we look for sleep apnea in the process of defining whether somebody's hypertension is essential or is it related to something else. And buspirone is for what's considered general anxiety um, syndrome or just having anxiety that's nonspecific but's not triggered ongoing and is ongoing. And in conclusion, as I said, it's about diet, 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 and then medications. And when we choose your medication, it needs to be matched to comorbidity or what risks you have of other problems. The ACEs and the ARBs are very protective in general. It's common for people to be on two medications because one can be used for protectiveness and the other one can be used for bringing the blood pressure down. I frequently think of elevated blood pressure as a symptom more than a disease, probably the symptom of eating poorly, mostly with too much salt, but there are other things it can be. There are genetic predispositions to losing sodium in your urine, making it easier for those people to maintain a lower blood pressure. There are probably some other genetic predispositions I do not understand about the elasticity of the vessels and many other things, I'm sure. So um, the choices in blood pressure medications are complicated, obviously. I've just listed things here. Hopefully I'll sign a blood pressure medicine today and there's another video about it. If not, we can target that medication. And you see, if it's not effective, there are many other groups to, to choose from and many other medications in each group. Thank you.